Okay, so estrogen also has effects on the brain, not both males and females. So I want to talk a little bit about those estrogen effects, but they're a little bit on expense. So if we fall within that critical period again, but this time we administer estrogen with male rodents, we end up seeing a male adult phenotypically male adult. Whereas with females, we provide estrogen during that critical period, we actually see characteristics. And so the conclusion here is that estrogen does something to masculinize the brain. So the question is, well, how does it masculinize the brain? Masculinization of the brain. The question is how. And it turns out that the female brain, remember we're growing up as vertebrates and as mammals, we're growing up in a developing in a in a maternal environment. And so estrogen is a trauma. In the female, This would appear that the brain is actually protected. So why is the female brain protected, in particular from estrogen? And why is the male brain not protected from estrogen? And in order to understand what's going on here, we actually need to first take a look at steroid synthesis. Now all of our steroids, they're derived from cholesterol, which is shown up here in the, uh, in the upper right hand corner, or I'm sorry, upper left hand corner of the image. And you can see from cholesterol, we go through a series of different enzymatic reactions that'll take me through what are known as the progestin, progestins, the progesterone molecules, the androgens, including testosterone, and then the estrogens. And what I want you to cue in on is this particular enzyme here called aromatase. Aromatase is going to take different androgens and will convert them irreversibly into analogs of estrogen, like that two beta estrogen. So not only are you in an internal environment that's full of estrogen, but in the female fetus, the fetal ovaries begin to produce low levels of estrogen as well. So estrogen is all around. And so somehow the female brain is protected from that estrogen. So the other thing that happens in both male and female fetuses is there's actually a hormone that's produced that's called alpha fetal protein. Alpha fetal protein. The other name for alpha fetal protein is going to also be called fetal neonatal estrogen binding protein. Neonatal estrogen binding protein, or just simply FBPA. And so the estrogen that is present in the fetus, both male and female, there's a capture of that little estrogen. that estrogen that's being produced. Now what ends up happening here is this binding protein makes the estrogen bulkier and larger. And so it prevents 
estrogen in both males and females from crossing the blood-brain barrier. Okay. So in both males and females, we have very low exposure to estrogen from the body into the brain. And in particular in females, that low estrogen uh, <clears throat> estrogen is, is protected or kept out of the brain. So low estrogen ends up in the brain because that estrogen is captured on that needle, neonatal estrogen binding protein. And so it can't readily cross the blood brain barrier. Now, in males, we actually see the same effect. So the little amount of estrogen that's being exposed into the peripheral tissues is captured up on neonatal estrogen binding protein. And very little of that, or of that endogenous um, somatic estrogen ends up in the brain. But there is a difference, right? Because the males have been programmed to differentiate the undifferentiated gonad into testes, and those testes begin to produce testosterone. And as that testosterone is produced, it's not captured up by a binding protein. So it remains in relatively free levels. And so in the brain, testosterone crosses the blood brain barrier, enters that tissue, and then is exposed to very high levels of aromatase. Very high levels of aromatase. And so we begin to catalyze this reaction from testosterone to 17 beta estradiol. And so in the brain of the male fetus, brain estrogen levels begin to increase in the males. We begin to experience estrogen in the brain in the males, but it's protected in the females because of the lack of testes and a testosterone source and the presence of the neonatal estrogen binding protein. Okay? Which males also have it, right? So just don't don't uh, separate this out that um, the males do not have the, the binding protein, they have the binding protein as well. So any estrogen that's produced in the body outside of the central nervous system it is going to be captured. And then the testosterone, which is only produced in perceptible levels in the male because of the presence of the testes, crosses the blood brain barrier, is exposed to aromatase in the brain, and you begin to see estrogen levels increase in the brain of males. And then that estrogen begins to program the brain in the hypothalamus for a pulsatile release rather than a signal release. And that's how the brain gets differentiated. So I want to take a moment now to kind of put everything back together and give another summary on the developmental effects. So with high levels of testosterone, we're actually going to see that we're going to have three different cell types that are affected in some way by testosterone that is produced from the differentiated testing. So in one cell type, Testosterone enters that cell, and then we have an enzyme like 5-alpha reductase.
5 alpha reductase that causes testosterone to be enzymatically converted to dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone enters into the nucleus to upregulate uh, proteins and genes that eventually lead towards the differentiation of the male external genitalia. Okay, so testosterone converted over to uh, dihydrotestosterone by 5-alpha reductase causes a series of differentiation events to occur in the male external genitalia. We also will have testosterone that goes directly into the nucleus. And then from there, we have proteins that are produced where we have differentiation male internal genitals male internal genitals um, including the duct system and then also we'll have the development of adult secondary sex characteristics. So testosterone goes directly to the nucleus, affects gene transcription there, and causes the differentiation of the male internal genital ducts, and then also uh, will affect adult secondary characteristics. That's what we say about adult secondary characteristics. And then we also will have testosterone that is converted to estradiol by the actions of aromatase. And that estradiol has an effect on transcription leading towards differentiation of the hypothalamus into a pulsatile hypothalamus or male hypothalamus. Okay, so when testosterone is present, we have these three major things that happen. Formation through dihydrotestosterone of the external genitalia. Directly through testosterone, the differentiation of the internal ducts, and then also later on, adult, uh, secondary adult characteristics, muscle mass, libido, sex drive, things like that. Uh, and then through aromatization of testosterone estradiol, we have the pulsatile formation of the, uh, the formation of the male hypothalamus. Does that make sense? <laughs> Okay, the next part of development that I want to talk about here is the pubertal transition. So what happens at puberty? So at puberty, both in males and females, we're going to have the differentiated gonads very active in this development process. So puberty, we're going to have before puberty, and then we'll have after puberty, during the pre-pubertal years. During pre-puberty, after the development of or the differentiation, I should say, of the, of the gonad. Prepubertal, the gonads slip into a state of quiescence. Okay, so gonads are active during development, and we have all that stuff that we just talked about happening. And then when we move into prepuberty, after birth, the gonads become quiescent. And then kind of the definition of when puberty happens is when 
the gonads reactivate or become active again. Right? So at puberty, the gonads change their function again. And a couple of the changes, the major changes that happen when we move out of quiescence back into uh, a higher level of activity is the, go different, uh, the differentiated gonad is going to produce a certain milieu of steroids. And that milieu of steroids is going to be dependent upon the, the gender, male versus female. And then we're also going to begin, begin to produce what are known as gametes. And gametes are the, the, um, the sexual cell, the reproductive cell in, in mammals. Uh, and so we're going to have to cut the number of chromosomes in half, right? The number of homo chromosomes in half. And so that process for males is this is really when it all begins. For females, You've actually, at birth, have already gone through about half of the process. You actually get stalled up in meiosis one near the end of meiosis one. And then when you reach puberty, that moves forward now uh, and makes those cells ready to continue through the rest of the process. Uh, and so at puberty, the endocrine axis that is, that's important here is going to be centered around the gonadotropins. Uh, and so we'll have gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus that will interact with uh, the pituitary, the gonadotropes, to produce the gonadotropins. And then those gonadotropins will release LH and FSH onto the testes and the ovaries or the gonads. So before puberty, quiescent, as we move into puberty, we reactivate, we open up this endocrine axis or start to use this endocrine axis. Pituitary, those are the gonadotropins. So as we open up that endocrine axis and start to use it, we're going to begin to see the steroids being produced in higher concentrations, begin to see the gametes develop uh, to be able to help fertilization to occur. So in the prepubescent individual, if you were to remove the pituitary from a prepubescent individual and place it into a postpubescent individual, so let's say we're doing this in rats, what we would actually find out is that the pituitary gland in the prepubescent individual has normal reproductive function. normal reproductive function. When we look at the gonads, what we find with the gonads is they actually exhibit normal reproductive function as well. And so it turns out that in the prepubescent, it's actually the hypothalamus that is significantly downregulated or is quiescent. So the hypothalamus is not functional. in the prepubescent, and so at the onset of puberty, this is where we have 
changes to the hypothalamus that cause the rest of the system, which is under basically normal function, just not being used, to now be utilized or to now upregulate. And so one of the questions that stems from this is why is why does the hypothalamic development dictate to Why does the hypothalamic development dictate puberty? And it turns out that there's actually no real consensus. We actually have four competing hypotheses. So hypothesis number one suggests that I'm supposed to be an app, not an alpha. So at puberty, Experience that occurs is a desensitization of the hypothalamus. And so, sensitivity to what? Sensitivity is very, very high to the hormones that have negative feedback on the hypothalamus prior to pu puberty. And so the, the hypothalamus is basically stuck in this continuous negative feedback uh, inhibition. Okay? Then at puberty, or really the change in the hypothalamus that would uh, indicate puberty, you have this decrease in the sensitivity of that negative feedback loop. And so that negative feedback inhibition by the steroids is going to be lifted. So the feedback inhibition is lifted, the hypothalamus because becomes less sensitive to those circulating hormones and begins to now send out signals to the pituitary so that it's no longer being inhibited or, or uh, in negative feedback. Okay, so number two. Number two suggests that there is a change that occurs in sleep patterns. And this change in sleep patterns affects the secretion of hormones. Okay, so sleep patterns change. And this is, you know, this is observable. This these sleep patterns they actually happen. Right? So with newborns, newborns spend about 50% of their sleep in a part of a, a uh, condition of sleep known as rapid, rapid eye movement. This is when you dream, um, your eyes move very, very quickly. It's kind of in between light sleep and deep sleep. And it has been associated with repair of neurons and uh, improvement in brain function and cognition and things like that to go into rest. However, as you age, the amount of time that you spend in breath actually decreases. And so adults are in REM sleep approximately 15% of the time or about one hour. And so for some of you, you may actually still dream a little bit. You're, 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 
know every month. So I basically have stopped now at 39 years old, and very rarely do I remember a dream. So we're going to be transitioning through this to over and over and over and over time. And so dreams are not as um, one that's just not as long time for kind of a dream to develop and kind of get the story on and all that kind of stuff. And so we, as we go through this transition where we go from 50% to 15%, we have some changes. Because one of the things that happens during REM sleep is we have low levels of LH secretion. So LH secretion during REM is suppressed. And so as REM begins to drop, we begin to have less of that inhibition of LH secretion. And so in early puberty, we transition from low secretion of LH towards much more pulsatile surging of LH, LH and FSH at night. So now we start to have LH and FSH surges rather than very low secretion. And then as we go a little bit further, later on in puberty, the surges occur all the time. So rather than just being regulated during the night, surges now become more frequent throughout the day. And with those FSH and LH surges, it's increasing and decreasing, increasing and decreasing. The feedback mechanism onto the hypothalamus is also very, very strong. Okay, um, hypothesis number three. Hypoth hypothesis number three is known as the critical weight hypothesis. Critical weight hypothesis. So the, the data for critical weight hypothesis comes from individuals who are classified as lean and individuals who are classified as obese uh, during childhood. The lean individual has a much higher likelihood to have a delayed progression of the onset of puberty. In addition, elite endurance athletes, females, elite and uh, elite female endurance athletes will actually experience amenorrhea if their body weight drops down below a certain critical level. So ultra um, ultra thin or skinny female athletes can go into amenorrhea when they stop cycling, they stop having a normal, uh, a normal period. Then on the other side of the spectrum are the children who exhibit obesity. And with obesity, what, what actually occurs is there's a higher rate of aromatization of androgens. Because lipid tissue or adiposity, uh, adipose tissue, has a, a, a much higher concentration of the aromatase enzyme. And so that higher aromatization of the androgens results in a higher production of estrogens. And then a decrease in 
the conversion of estrogens to certain metabolites. And so you get, end up with higher levels of estrogen, and with higher levels of estrogen, especially in the female, will drive the function of the ovaries and the go uh, and then eventually the hypothalamus as well. So those obese individuals actually slip into puberty statistically earlier in life than a lean child. Now the last theory, or I should say hypothesis, number four, is centered around a protein called GRP. So the GRP54 gene produces the GRP54 protein. Which is a G-linked receptor protein or isoform. And the observations for hypothesis number four is based off of an observation in a condition that's known as idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So these individuals experience low gonad function. And what has been shown is that GRP54, when mutated, leads to IHH. Low gonad function in these individuals with IHH, and that is associated with diseases and associated with a mutation in the GRP54 gene. So, how is GRP fit into this whole schematic? actually fits in because GnRH release requires GRP54. And the data that was used to kind of illustrate this lead between GRP54 to cause release of GnRH comes from mice with a knockout for GRP54. Okay, so GRP54 uh, is knocked out in these mice. And in these mice, these mice have normal hypothalamic levels of TNRH. But they have no release of that release. If we take these knockout mice, knocked out for GRP54, and we do a brain cannulization, a hypothalamic cannulization, basically this is inserting a needle or a cannula and targeting directly through the brain tissue to the region of the hypothalamus that can infuse in. GRP54 uh, protein into these mice that have that knockout. The 
mice infused with GRP54 end up on doing this no release mechanism and they end up having normal hypothalamic release of DNRH. Okay, so we're covering a lot of ground. You know, we started out with conception, moved into differentiation of the gonad, differentiation of the duct system, differentiation of the external or development of the external genitalia. We talked about the development of the male brain versus the female brain. We've now gone through uh, puberty. And so I want to just kind of step back and give you kind of a full-scale summary of summer of fertilization to puberty. Okay, so this is a number nine. We got summarization of fertilization to puberty. Summary. Fertilization to puberty. I don't know what happened there. That's supposed to be. All right, so we have the undifferentiated gonad. And remember that with the undifferentiated gonad, the medulla versus the cortex, whatever becomes active, that part of the tissue develops, the other part of the tissue progresses towards an ovary and a cat. Now, the default is female. So female is just going to kind of be the default. So to not be female, to be male, we have to have some things in place that are going to uh, differentiate to the test uh, to the testy, and then we'll see a bunch of stuff happen from there. So in an individual, the undifferentiated gonad begins to develop first, and if that individual has a Y chromosome, that Y chromosome contains a gene called the SRY gene or test the determining factor that leads towards production of the SRY protein. Okay. SRY protein affects the undifferentiated gonad, causes um, uh, development of the medulla, which leads towards differentiation of the undifferentiated gonad into a testosterone. Now, once the testy begins to develop, we have two major hormones that begin to be produced initially. One of those is a Mullerian regression factor. And that individual tubular system that would become the Mullerian ducts is now going to regress. We also produce from that undifferentiated testy testosterone. And testosterone is going to promote the development of the other duct system called the Wolfian ducts. And these will give rise to the internal duct system, the seminiferous physical, uh, the seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, development of the bass or ductus deferens, etc. Testosterone is also going to be a source for dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone is important in the development of uh, the external genitalia, so program the development of the penis, the scrotum, and the prostate. 
as well, which is actually free kernel that helps you develop the phosphate. And so that's the initial development. And as time passes, as time passes, the testy becomes quiescent. So it goes through quiescence, and then more time passes. So time passes, becomes quiescent. During that time, more time passes. And we now move into puberty. And with puberty, basically have four different uh, hypotheses on how this may work. It may actually end up being a combination of all four. But at puberty, what we end up seeing is an increase in the release of the gonadotropins. And with the release of the gonadotropins, this leads back towards more production of testosterone. And then from there, testosterone now moves into a post-puberty production of sperm cells called spermatogenesis. And we've not talked about spermatogenesis, but this is kind of the, the next step. Okay, so that's basically the summarization of what happens to go through development, to go through puberty, and now to move into the production of sperm cells. So this is where we're going to pick up spermatogenesis. Okay, so inside of the testes, the testes is basically connected tissue that wraps up a tubular system known as the seminiferous tubules. When testosterone begins to be reproduced after puberty and we start to upregulate spermatogenesis and the production of sperm, those seminiferous tubules become active. I want to take a look at this sort of in cross section. I'm actually going to draw this out for you. So, if we were to take a look at a seminiferous tubule and just take a cross section through that tubule, what you're going to find is you have a lumen and a luminal wall inside of that seminiferous tubule. And all of this here in the wall is several different types. Of the cell. So if we kind of. Yeah, this is the lumen here, and then the cell wall. 
or I mean, I'm sorry, the, the luminal wall made up of um, several different types of cells. And so if we kind of blow that up, lumen would be here, and we would have several different cells that are known as the Sertoli cells. Okay, so that's what those are. Those are the Sertoli cells, and they're basically support cells that we find in the lumen. And then we're also going to find these other cells. We're going to call these spermatogonia. And these spermatogonium are going to make their way through the luminal wall from one location to the next location until they reach the, the luminal wall. And they will now be a mature sperm. And they go through this process of differentiation from one side of the luminal wall towards the lumen. And then they get stacked up inside of the lumen with their fully developed flagella, the nucleus containing 23 chromosomes. An acrosome that covers the top of it, which only allows a male sperm from a given organism to fertilize a female uh, ovum or egg from that same um, from that same organism. Okay. So this would be our mature sperm cell. Spermatogenesis is this entire process from the exterior wall of the lumen to the lumen itself, having differentiations in cell divisions, both mitotic and meiotic, all the way along uh, from exterior to interior. Okay? Um, so the Sartoli cells are kind of the support cells that make up the majority of the structure, and then the spermatogonia are going to make their way through um, outside to inside. And so we're going to get we're going to get more into that, but before we do, I want to talk about uh, the Sartoli cells, and then there's another cell that we need to talk about as well called the Leydig cell. Um, but let's start off with the Sartoli cell. So the Sartoli cells are actually support cells that will help to progress spermatogenesis. So they will support the sperm cells production. The um, Sertoli cells actually create this barrier known as the blood testes barrier and regulates what gets into the semi-nephrous tubules where the sperm cells are being produced. And that's really important, right? Because we'll, I don't want to have any sort of toxins or other molecules that get into the, the tissue where I'm developing the sperm that could potentially cause things like mutations or could uh, prevent uh, the normal mitotic or meiotic division. And so I end up with sperm cells that have extra chromosomes or not enough chromosomes or mutated chromosomes. And so I do want to have that protected, and so that support and that protection comes from the Sertoli cells. Now, a second type of cell that we have in the male reproductive system are called the Leydig cells. And these are actually not associated with the seminiferous tubule, so they're outside of the seminiferous tubule. But they're still very important because this is my actual cell of androgen production. And what we're going to find out is that there's a pretty intricate hormonal regulatory circuit that controls spermatogenesis. And testosterone in particular is going to be the rate setter or what sets the rate for the progression of maturation at the end of spermatogenesis. And so lighting cells are going to provide that input of androgens. Okay, so both of these cells are 
under hormonal control. And so the experiment that was done to identify how these two cells are controlled, they use what are known as radio labels or radio label tracers. Okay? So from the hypothalamus, we have GnRH that's produced that releases to the pituitary to release both of our gonadotropins, LH and FSH. And then it's LH and FSH that target to the gonads. Okay, so that's our basic endocrine access for the gonadotropins. Um, so experiments with radio labeled tracer. I'm going to use this symbol here to describe this um, this experiment that used radio labeled tracers. And so basically, a radio label tracer is a, is a radio isotope that then I can detect and spe identify specifically what radio isotope that is. And common ones are, um, well, actually, I don't really know what the most common ones are, but um, they'll use, um, I'm forgetting the name. Let me look it up here. Um, the heck did it No, it doesn't matter if I seem smarter. I just cannot remember the name of the most common radioisotope. I can't remember the name of it. So we use a radio isotope. Um, I started with it. I'm thinking it starts with an S. Maybe I have it written down somewhere. Probably not. Anyways, we look for we look for radioactive decay, and we can measure the radioactive. Okay, and the characteristics of that radioactive decay would help us to identify the type of radioisotope that that decay is coming from. And so what we'll do is, in radio-labeled tracer experiments, is we'll basically... So that's used in blood. Um, it, I mean, it, it might be your rate. They, they use... Uranium? I don't think they use uranium. Strontium, I think, is what they use a lot of times. Um, and then So I think radioisotopes of stront strontium. Okay, and then this does that decay to well, anyways. They use and that decay is what's detectable with a device called a um, Yeah. Which is the next one next one up. So it is basically that reaction, that beta decay reaction there. We can pick that up and look at the characteristics. And then they'll use a different one, and it might actually be rubidium, and rubidium decays to um, to something else. But anyways, based off of that decay from the tracer, you set up so that you have two different tracers. We'll call that one one that you hook up to LH, and then you have a second tracer, two, that we hook up to FSH. And so now we've radio labeled LH and FSH. And when we put these into cell culture or sometimes in a mammalian system, and then we go and we dissect out uh, the testicular tissue, 
and we identify the types of cells and we look to see what radioactivity is in those cells. What ends up happening is we find out that LH binds to the Leydig cells. And with the binding to the Leydig cells, we have a cyclic AMP second messenger system that's upregulated that leads towards testosterone production. FSH will show binds to Centoli cells. Also leads towards an upregulation in cyclic AMP. And then causes observed effects in the Sertoli cells. And I'm going to tell you about those effects here of FSH in just a second. Okay? So LH leads to the Leydig cells and regulates testosterone. FSH targets to the Sertoli cells through a cyclic AMP second messenger. Um, just generically right now, we're referring to it as effects. And now I'm going to tell you more of these effects that are associated with FSH. So one of the things that FSH will do was going to increase, cause an increase in the number of luteinizing hormone receptors. in the live cells. So basically, FSH is the mechanism, probably something on the order of paracrine, uh, where we're upregulating the expression of the LH receptor. Those lighting cells become more sensitive to LH and uh, increase their ability to produce testosterone. FSH also results in an increase in androgen binding protein levels. So if I'm going to set up my Leydig cells so that they can produce more testosterone, I'm going to have more testosterone that's going to enter circulation. So I want more androgen binding proteins to pick up that androgen, those androgens and the testosterone uh, to induce circulation. FSH also leads to the production of a hormone called inhibin. And inhibin is involved in the negative feedback here because it results in the inhibition of FSH. We're also going to see an effect on spermatogenesis. And this effect on spermatogenesis is possibly indirect, indirectly caused. And most uh, most common idea is that it's uh, going to cause the effect through the fact that it's upregulating testosterone. Stuff or it could be a good point to just keep on going for another 10 minutes. Okay, so I want to kind of give you again another summary here um, to take a look at the, the central axis, the gonadal axis. Um, and then take a look at what happens in the testes and the ovaries and identify these feedback loops as well. Uh, so uh, we're going to start out with gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This is going to be another figure. 
Ln Rh. From the hypothalamus, targets the pituitary to release LH and FSH, which targets to either our testes in males or the testes, or I'm sorry, the testes, ovaries in female. In testes, the observable results here are from the gonadotropins is sperm maturation, so sperm mature, and then we also affect the activity of the Sartoli cells. Over on the ovarian side, I'm going to have to bump this up. Yeah, so the Sertoli cells are, are, are going to be activated to um, do all of the things that we just talked about from FSH. On the ovarian side, we're going to have follicular maturation. And development of what's known as the granulosum. And these granulosa cells is what supports the maturing follicle. Okay. So basically, an androgen releasing hormone leads to the release of LH and FSH. We have several different things that happen on the testicular side spermatogenesis, the sperm maturation, and the function of the Sertoli cells to support that process are going to be upregulated with the ovarian side. The follicle is going to be stimulated to go through maturation, and then we're going to have development of the granulosa cells, which is the support cell that surrounds the ovum as it develops. So the big thing that I want to kind of uh, highlight here is that uh, is the, the negative feedback loops that we have. So from these cells, um, or the tissue of the ovary, we also are going to have inhibin. And same thing over here with the testes. We're going to have inhibin as a, an effect of the FSH. Okay? Now from the inhibin, inhibin actually affects GnRH release in a negative feedback mechanism. And then over on this side, we have a negative feedback only for FSH. And then it's very similar on this side as well, where we have a negative influence on GnRH and then a negative influence only on FSH from inhibitor. So inhibin is a FSH production inhibitor. So as we activate the testing in the ovary with FSH and LH release, inhibin is produced, and that facilitates the negative feedback on the gonadotropin releasing hormone release and on FSH, but it's going to target FSH production. Also involved in this mechanism here is the luteinizing hormone receptor. Luteinizing hormone receptor. And I'm going to take a look at this from the testicular perspective. And I want to give you, again, some experimental data to kind of describe what's going on here. Uh, so I want you to consider removal of the pituitary. That's called a hypophysectomy. So hypophysectomy is uh, to remove the pituitary. And what we observe with hypophysectomy 
is a loss of the testicular LH receptor. If we administer LH and FSH in this animal, we still get no receptor. So LH and FSH appear to have no effect on the expression of the luteinizing hormone receptor, at least in the testicular model. If we administer what's known as anti-gematotropin or PCP hormone or estrogen, that's P2, or testosterone, then what we observe here is low LH and FSH levels. normal age receptors. And so based off of this experimental data and the fact that we don't observe a negative feedback on luteinizing hormone from what's going on in the given, what we might conclude is that it is other hormones that maintain LH receptor numbers. Okay, so LH receptor numbers, there's another hormone, and what I'm going to implicate here is prolactin. And the reason I do that is because if I provide a mouse with anti prolactin, this results in that mouse having no. LH receptor expression. But if I, and this again is that mouse with the removed pituitary. If I administer prolactin, I now have receptor, LH receptor expression. that is a good place to stop.